this morning and uh, really looking forward to what um, to what God is going to do on this platform for us this morning. Uh, Reverend Lawrence already mentioned about the experience of the minister's wives and that God has just richly um, blessed in that area and, and it's going to bless in, in, in many, many more lives as that continue. I want to say this to you that um, everything we do on this platform, we, we, have a, we have a theme, you know. We don't have any, um, any direction as to where we're going, but we do have a director. We don't have plans, we're not a planner. So whatever shows up on this platform, we didn't come up with it. We just wait. And as the facilitators speak to us, we in obedience follow. So we are here today, not by Reverend Lawrence design or my design or any member of this team design. We are here because the facilitators planned it, gave it to us, and we are doing it. So I look forward to what's going to transpire in this time together. Um, so let me tell you what I, I, I hope will take place today. One, I hope you will hear, you will hear extremes of help. I'm a, I'm a minister's kid. Uh, you will hear of the, of the blessing of, of how well that turned out. You're going to have the pain of, of what that experience is. So what we're hoping to bring to you today is that for, for those on the platform today who have come here to, to see what God has to offer you, we're hoping that those who are probably feeling discouraged being a, a minister's child will find encouragement today. Those who are probably broken will find healing today. And those who have uh, continue to enjoy the rich blessings and, and, and uh, the, the guidance they receive will, will, will see how good God has been to them and they will, they will just continue to live in ways that will bring honor and, and glory to God. And so, and for parents on here who still have young kids at home, we hope that you will get tools uh, from this session that will help you to be uh, even a better um, uh, parent to your child. Your child will grow up in, in wanting to love the Lord and follow the Lord um, on this journey. So this is the things we hope will happen today. And some more things will happen that we have no clue, the facility does we do. So I'm glad to be here today. And I look forward to what um, God is going to do for us today. So at this time, Reverend Lawrence is going to come back on to, um, to introduce our first uh, presenter for the morning. Thank you. Amen. Thank you so much, Reverend Karim. And I do say amen and amen. Every time he says it, we do not have a plan, but we have a planner. And that planner is the one who would have indicated those who would share today. And so we want you to receive from what will be shared today because the Lord has something to say to you through each presenter today. Our first presenter is Darren Brown. And he is an active born again Christian, he says, who has served the Church of the Nazarene as a treasurer, trustee, youth camp board chairman, youth council, men's ministry president and musician. He holds a master's in business administration, finance concentration from the University of Leicester and bachelor's degree in accounting and international business. Darren is currently the financial accounting superintendent at Jamalco, where he anal analyzes and reports on the company's financial statements among other things. And I guess those other things are plenty other things. He writes a weekly financial column in the Freedom Com Rain newspaper and is a new author with a book entitled Financial Truths for Daily Living. Darren is happily married to Kimberly for almost 14 years and I think I saw her come on the platform. Welcome, my sister. And they have two daughters, Sarah Jade and Soraya, and they are from Jamaica, the beautiful island of Jamaica. So, Sir Darren, over to you, sir. Bless you, bless you. Thank you for, for that warm welcome. I greet the facilitators of God's anatomy for marriage, um, all the pastors who are on the platform, um, everyone, good morning from the beautiful island of Jamaica, specifically I am in Kingston, Jamaica. Um, when I was asked to share in this session, I was saying, and I thought God to really reveal unto me 
what it is that you would want me to speak um, in this time. Um, the dialogue I had with um, Reverend Lawrence um, as to what it is that we wanted to seek out of this session was to gain an understanding of the matters that affect pastors, children. So I'll start with my sojourn um, growing up. Um, my, 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 my dad, Reverend Lionel Brown, he, well, he's recently, um, the, the, the role of district superintendent. So we are from the Nazarene, the Church of the Nazarene in Jamaica, Jamaica West District. Um, he just recently um, vacated the seat of the district superintendent. So my sojourn in terms of the, the, the Christian faith started way back in the eighties. I, 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 I all often say that I was born in the church, right? Um, so, I'm gonna date myself, 1982, I was born. I, when we started, my, my dad, Reverend Lionel Brown, um, was a young minister. Um, then um, we started uh, in a small basic school in the, in the country um, where we went through the, the, the whole building of a ministry. So I believe that throughout all that experience, I was part of his ministry, his entire ministry growing up because I was literally there. Um, maybe after I was born, of course he would have started, but I, 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 I believe in terms of his fulsome immersion in the, in, 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 in um, the, the church of Nazarene, I was there. So we started there. So I had the experience of start going to multiple tent meetings. We started it under a tent, et cetera. Um, you know, the whole challenges that come in terms of you being there, you alone in church with just pastor and his wife and just a few members until gradually the, the ministry would have grown um, exponentially. So my growing up, I saw what it was or it was demonstrated in front of me of what a good shepherd should be right I, I i believe if there was ever a person that i i, I consider as a pastor or a real shepherd i consider my dad such now growing up the the, the, the responsibility as the eldest son so there are three brothers of us right um i'm the eldest it was very pressuring, I believe. No, because I'm the eldest one, Pastor Pitney, first one, there was, there was this heavy weight that was on my shoulder. No, it's like I couldn't do nothing wrong because anything at all. Um, back in the days, I know things have changed so differently now, but back in the days, there was a level of, of respect that was considered, you know, or, or, or there was, there was this, this feeling that, hey, you're a pastor's children, so you need to behave this way. So you can't be this way like the, the other kids. There must be something that must be different about you. So I grew up with that sort of weight on my shoulder. Albeit, I said, boy, I never, really, I never wanted this. No, so that was in and of itself a challenge. What I grew to, to understand too, the, the, the role of a pastor, right? And, 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 I, and I say candidly, a true pastor, because growing up, I would have seen many different um, pastors, you know, apostles, prophets, you name it, right? And when we're talking pastor, there's pastor and there is pastor. That is what I believe and I know, <laughs> right? So with that comes, there comes a level of, responsibility, a shepherd, meaning they have to nurture their flock. I believe, in my opinion, back then when I looked at it, right, um, my father immersed himself so much that he availed himself to people in a way that I believe it, it tend to compromise in a way the, 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 the family time. So there were times when I see some people come 
pastor, I have this problem. Can you speak to me about this? Can you have time? And he would spend a lot of time and he would give um, pastoral counsel to the person. And sometimes I said to myself, my goodness, these people, they, they don't have anything. To, they can't otherwise seek God because, I mean, we know uh, from, the, from the scripture, right? We have a direct relationship with God now. They are no longer... Um, there is no longer a partition. So you can go directly to God and bring all your cares to God. So in that, in that way and in that vein, I, I saw it and I was saying, no man, this is too much. This is too much. I don't want anything like this. So growing up, I had this, this thing. But it, to me, it was twofold because um, yes, on one hand, these were some of the things that frustrated me. But I believe the grace of God would have been on me and I would have grown to love and appreciate the ministry and what it entails and what it is about in terms of the whole matter of servanthood. And I would have grown all, sometime I grumble. I remember this, uh, this a pivotal part in our life when, when I actually finished high school, right? So imagine I finished, passed my CXE results was looking now to make that transition to sixth form, that is the pre-university, that's what we call it here um, in Jamaica. And I remember my dad came to us and said, well, we have a family discussion um, about a uh, thing that God has laid on his heart, right? And a, a, a vision. So he brought it to us and we sat as a family and he discussed about him moving from where we were initially lived in Westmoreland to another parish, which was Mandeville, right? Um, in his capacity as district superintendent, um, God would have deposited him, him the vision to go and uh, um, create the, 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 a, a vision retreat incident that the name is the Vision Retreat Center, right? Um, so he, he was so challenged to go there and to make a, a, a difference there and then no, that started a whole different spiral in my mind. I'm like, what? No, I have in my mind what I want to do. I want to go to Sixth Form. I'll, I'll be with my friends and all of this. Then again, here comes a vision from God that he had. I'm like, where this thing coming from? Again, it was a whole matter of serving other people. So I, I, I know I challenged him at that point because at that point, I spent a lot of time with my grandma in the evenings um, to, you know, to stay with her because she was there. My grandfather had passed a couple of years, years ago. So I was the, 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 the one, the grandson that would stay there. So I said, I started arguing, no, daddy, you can go. You and mommy and my other brothers can go. I will stay because, you know, I have to stay with grandma. But he was resolute. No, my entire family will be going. I'm not leaving anybody. And I am telling you, I had a warm time there because I just couldn't see it. I, I, you have your vision. Okay, you go fulfill your vision. I have my vision for my life. I know what I wanted. So again, that was another point in my life where like, you know, this thing not will work out with me now because another frustrating part with this whole, the whole ministry. So yes, I... I, I, I love the ministry growing up because I immersed myself because I, 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 I started you now, I got involved in terms of doing things for the Lord. I was a musician. I involved uh, myself in um, the youth ministries, right? You know, a, a plethora of things. But there was this, this mixed thing where I feel like there was this tug of war. Yes, I know the value, or I believe then that I knew the value. No. Growing up now, um, immersing myself more in the word, I, 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 I realized that there was a subtle difference. But there was this fight that he gave so much to, 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 to the ministry. And then on top of it, you have a lot of ungrateful members or, or persons of the flock. And I have to be very pointedly. There are times when you hear things as, 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 as a pastor child that, You'll talk some things about pastor or you will be in a meeting and you see some of the even very pastors that stand up and wants to say something about um, your dad. I, I recall instances like that where I, I, I had to fight with myself not to go out there and really challenge 
pastor based on what they were saying because I know that this was a real man of God that gave selfishly to it. And when you hear certain utterances, you're saying to yourself, is what, is what happened to these persons or these men of, men, well, let me not use the word, man of God, but these men who are so, who are called, right? So that again, it's another, that rubbed me the wrong way because there, in, in some instances, you realize that, hey, there are a lot of persons who um, are not necessarily respectful of, of the office of a pastor and what is it that a pastor brings to the table and, or a shepherd and the sacrifices that they make, right? And then now on the other, they'll come now and they'll chastise the pastor. Oh, you're not doing this. You're not, you're not doing this. Or um, you, are, you are doing this not the way how we expect it to be done. And all, not a whole plethora of things. And, and I mean, a lot of persons here know of some of these things. So I won't necessarily delve into it. But these are some of the things that were, were, were demonstrated in front of me that, that kind of pulled me to, 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 to that side where I have to wonder, boy, this, 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 this thing, as a pastor's child, I went through a lot of this, a lot of battle. So yes, I wanted to fight for my dad when I hear things happen, right? Um, yes, I wanted to be like other children and not have to live a certain way or appear a certain way. So all these pressures built on me. It was not until, like, you know, um, I think more and more when I now transition and immerse myself more in the word of God and the Holy Spirit will now start depositing me what it is that I, um, what is his desire for me and in terms of how I need to be functioning, right? Then I can, I, I, I got a clearer understanding and, um, of the vision that my, 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 my dad would have, um, would have got, right? And then I, and I could have understood and things started to unfold in front of me and I understood it, but it was very challenging, very challenging. Um, I think, and to his credit, I, I know we would have a lot of sojourn, I would go with him as uh, in his capacity as district superintendent, I remember a number of, of times we, the different parishes that he would visit, I would go along with him. So I was there along with him and I, and I see the, the, the love and the, 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 the compassion that he showed for persons. He was very tolerant and all of that. And those are some of the tenants that I might, myself would have um, developed you know, seeing that sort of behavior being modeled in front of me. So yes, for me, I would say that I would not, I, I, I got a, a, a mixed bag, so to speak, right? On one hand, there are some things that I would have seen that would have rubbed me the wrong way, but then I saw where or, or I, I, I understood the vision that he wanted to do. And as a result, I could have um, appreciate what it is that God was doing through him and ultimately what he wanted us as a family to do, you know, as a ministry. So that is my story. Um, I, I am hopeful that there was a little bit of understanding where I'm coming from and uh, I turn back over to the moderator and I welcome any questions that may arise based on my presentation. Thank you. Oh. Thank you, Darren. And please stay on screen. Thank you for sharing. I really appreciate um, your, your honesty and your, your openness about, um, about your journey so far. And of course, I have a few questions that I'd like to ask you, but I also want to invite our listeners as you listen to our presenters, note your questions, and I'll give you a chance to, to certainly ask those questions uh, along the way as you um as as we come to this to this part of the conversation. So Darren, I uh, so I was in Jamaica with your mom and dad and you guys in 2005, 2006, doing some stuff there. So uh, it's 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 been a while dead before that as well. But um 
I yeah. say the people that um, Jamaica is my second home in the Caribbean, from Trinidad, of course. But you know, I I, I really love Jamaica, so it's good to hear. Yeah. I listen to you uh, sharing the. I just. Just talk a little, uh, of, especially for those on the platform to get a, a sense of that. Talk a little about in terms of all of the wrestling you had to do, especially as a teenager with all of the, you know, the ministry and the changes. Talk about how did your parents relate to you personally that you didn't become discouraged and got lost about this following Jesus thing because this ministry is so all-consuming. Talk about their personal relating to you that, that help you to feel confident that you did not abandon the, 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 the walk with the Lord. All right, so um, thank you for that, um, Reverend Karim. The, I think what they, they, they do, they had a, this subtle way of, of preaching. I, 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 I put it this way. I know my dad spoke a lot to me from the platform. <laughs> so I know some of his message was pointed <laughs> to me in a, in a right, subtle right. way, right? In a subtle way. Okay. So don't necessarily say, okay, you will sit and you will talk. Yes, yeah, we'll have that. But a lot of his messaging, I believe, yes. would have come through the platform. Or maybe the Holy Spirit was using him as a person to reach me. But I, 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 I got it from that way, from the platform. So during that time, you know, a lot of times we would, we would have gone through that transition. They would have, um, yes, I said from the platform. But there are times that they will sit and they will talk to us. I, I think my brothers would have been much younger in the earlier stage of the ministry. But they, my, my, my dad's vision was for the family to, to minister. So we were a right. core, we were a team to really right. minister. So we immersed ourselves in every area. Um, in the earlier stage, as I, as I remember, I remember pulling buckets of water, you know, taking out the, 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 the tent, you know, the tent meeting and water coming yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All of those uh -huh. things, we immersed ourselves. And that in, in and of itself was a lesson, right? It was a lesson that was being taught. And in everything that we went through, he, he started to point out these little, these subtle things. And it's a whole matter of servanthood, right? We were the last yeah. one that would have, would have left. We have to take up all the benches and we pack them. So we, we put out the benches, Right, and we also stood, and we have to pack them up too. So all of those little things, and through all of those lessons, I would have now um, developed also in my own personal um, life now going forward. These life skills about serving others, not necessarily in church, but wider in terms of servant right. good. So I believe there, 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 there were a lot of teaching from them in a little okay. um, bits and pieces which was, no, I, I, I could fully comprehend and appreciate. Yes, yes, no, good. Thank you, for, thank you, that, that's, that's, that's really good. And the thing you said about that, you and your wrestling, you know, uh, finishing, you know, he's getting ready for sixth form and all of that. And there's a very fine line here where, where parents have to wrestle what the kids think their dreams are and really what, you know, and when the teenagers tell the parents, well, you know, um, and, and some parents go to the extreme or let's follow the teenager dream rather than, you know, because my child comes first. And, and so a little about how you, how you work through that and resolve that if you, you didn't lose that sense of your parents abandoning you, doing what they want, but you stayed, you, you still continued on with them. I, I, yes. So I, I think that was, that was a pivotal um, part of my life because at that point I thought I'm a, an, an adult. I, I am an adult now. I, I, I believe that I, I make that transition. So I think what they, they, they did was to, they, I think even my mom, I recall my mom would have sat me down one side and kind of cast the vision of what daddy wanted, right? What it is that he, um, God would have deposited in him at that time and what they wanted to realize. And as such, they would have, she would have cast this vision. Oh, I will get you into a nice um, sixth form elsewhere. So I went to uh, Manchester High instead of sixth form. They, um, I think for even that summer, they sent me away to my aunt in the States. So okay. I remember 1998, right? So there, there's a little thing I, I'm saying to myself, these are little bribes that they're using, but they kind of <laughs> stood me down in a way. Yes, moved me down in a way. Yes. So when I came back and um, we enrolled into Manchester High, 
um yes it i really felt it was a new environment i didn't know anybody there or anything like that um but eventually um i guess my personality is one which which embodies everybody and then naturally i fit in so it was not bad after all and then oh, okay. you know yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so I, I i think they did their their their, their job well yes Good, good. And I just want to make a, a sufficient appearance in the call right now, especially young kids. It's interesting that you and your dad were long ahead, but your mom was able to cast the vision. You know, and sometimes the, some parent, they feel they have to convince the child and just let, let the other parent who, who the child is soft towards at the moment cast the vision. And I'm so glad you said that, that your mom was able to see what your dad was trying to say. Now, if your dad kept pushing you, we're having a different conversation today. Right. So that, that, no, that's good. No, that's good. Thank you. Okay. I'll keep talking. I need to, I, there are people on the platform. Let's open up some questions. You can put your questions in the chat. You can open your mic, however you feel safe. Uh, you feel you want to do it, but you have some questions for Darren or something you said you want to have clarity on. Would you feel free now to please do that? And Aaron, I think I saw in the chat there's a question. Did you ever have to defend your parents uh, with your peers? Almost definitely. Almost definitely. Pastor, Pastor Pitney, Pastor Thief, Pastor Thief, Pastor just want church people money and all of these things. These are, are common things that, that, that run through the thread. So sometimes I, I sometimes. I remember growing up, I kind of felt coy to not say my father was a pastor or anything like uh -huh. that. Yes, I, I sometimes, because there's the stigma that comes with it. And as I, I had alluded to earlier, right, the, the, the heavy mantle that is on you when you are a pastor's child, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So I had to defend some instances, but gradually you grow up and say, you know, no. The God, God will defend you. It's not, it's not for me to do to defend you. Yeah, but right, I know instances right. I remember vividly. I had to know it's not a pastor thief. Oh, my father is not a thief, right? And and my not a right. So I had to, 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 to do that because of course we know in ministry there's pastors and there are pastors, right? And yeah, all of that. Yeah. So 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 yes, I, I had to do that in the past. Okay, okay, good. Thank you. All right, any other questions or comment from the platform? Um, Errol, yeah. could I ask a question? Yeah. Morning, yes. Darren. Mark Green. Lawrence here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, one question. Um, you, you are a part of a, yeah, there were three of you. How did you as the elder one have to navigate with your with your with your siblings in terms of that, you know. I mean, I don't know you can I don't think you can share everything, you know, is you know, it's for them to share, but um, how did they deal with it? Or how you would you have to maybe assist and help them in dealing with the pressures as well as a pastor? Okay. What problems they might have faced with that that you can share with us? Um my recollection, I know growing up. We, we uh, earlier, I remember my, my, my mom, she went to study at the university um, growing up. So, so daddy was the one that would have um, been responsible for, 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 for that part. You know, she tried to come back, you know, on the weekend sometimes and stuff. So I had no to have the responsibility as the elder one to kind of, um, groom them in a way i wouldn't say groom but assist more as the eldest with with, with, with with daddy in trained um so you know getting ready sunday school all of that even though young as i may be i i assisted i remember that part so that was a, a, a critical stage um in terms of their development too that i had to do but um critically i knew they look up to me as the as the as the eldest son so from time to time, I would, I believe I would have been a source of inspiration and encouraged them along the way 
similar challenges that they would go through in terms of what I alluded to earlier about defending um, defending uh, my, or my, 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 my father, right? Uh, um, along with a lot of these accusations that come. And there are a lot of things that maybe even my father, like persons who talk to me differently about or whatnot, that, and I would share accordingly, right? So to answer you, yeah, rightly, they would have to give their version of the story. <laughs> but I, 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 I think that this was something that jumped out at me, you know? I could remember. Thank you, Darren. So let me just ask a question on the back of that very question, Robin. I was just asking you there, um, Darren. In terms of the, the, the pressure, talk a little about the pressure of not just the, uh, being the eldest, but being the, the um, pastor's son, you know, and, and um, the how people treat you different from the people who are not in, in ministry, how their children are treated. And probably you could even share a story or two, but talk about what that pressure uh, did to you and how, it, you know, how you were able to manage uh, with that pressure of being a, the pastor's son while other people okay. were able to just be whatever they want to be. Right. So I grew up with the, with the, with the, with the um, as you said, with the pressure of, hey, you're going to be the pastor, you know? You're going to be the pastor. So people constantly will say that, you know, I, I guess it's a natural um, thing. I mean, you're, you're the eldest son, so you, you, you constantly do this. So you will hear people come or, or a church member come, you know, so you can't go out there, so you can't do this, you know, because your father is there and you have to represent your father and you have to be this sort of person. So it's like, Every single time you're like, what? I can't live a normal life like, like the regular person out here. <laughs> yes, so, yes. So it, there, was the, the, there was this constant thing that persons come to you and they will tell you what they expect of you, right? Because you're a pastor, son, you're a pastor, pick me, you're the first one, right? So I was always in um, feeling that pressure. So even today, when, I, when you grow up and, you know, um, I mean, no, you, you have an appreciation. And you, you, you know of a prophetic word that would go out. And I don't know if a prophetic word would go out over my life sometime. And I kind of wrestle with it to say, yes, you have a pastoral anointing upon you, right? But then the fleshly man would like to say, Pastor, I know everything that a real pastor goes through and everything. So there's this constant wrestle, right? That, that goes on in the mind like, Boy, if me for be my father, real, real pastor, pastor, mm, is there so many things. I, I'm not, and, 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 and as I said, I live the life. I, I know exactly what it is in terms of, in terms of, I think I make, I, 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 I can write the book about what's the expectation, the role of a pastor in and of itself, because it was modeled in front of me. So I know exactly that. But of right, course, right. you know, the call is, is, is the important thing, right? And the Holy yes, Spirit, yes. you know, will, is the one you know, that would pass it in you what it is yes. to do. But that, that is always the constant thing. There were persons, I remember one, 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 one afternoon, I had my cousins in the, in the, in the, in the, in the country and uh, we were there and we were playing and stuff. And I don't know, I caught some bad word, caught some bad word, bad words. I don't know. If you, in decent language, let me put it that way. Maybe you know? <laughs> right. I remember because they, they frustrated me so much, and I am telling you, before I reached my house, the news would have gone there, and the chastisement that I got from persons, Pastor Brown's son, are you there? Gonna? But I was so frustrated. I remember they were troubling me. They were teasing me, and I don't know. Yeah, what got over me and I, yeah. And of course, when I went home also, I would have been properly, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. someone. <laughs> right, so I, I, I remember one, um, one of those experiences too, but I'm telling you, it, it was, it's a tremendous pressure that is born on you. I don't know if other, 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 other persons, they will be speaking about it, but I know the pressure that, that came on me. You know, right, right. yeah, yeah, thank you. And you kept you kept saying something all through your, your presentation today and even answering the question. It 
comes back to what your father was able to convince you of that he has a call right. you know and i think if you could speak to your dad i think hey yeah, yeah. probably you say this to you that his call was right. by the people in the church it wasn't by the church of the nazarene it was by god so therefore right. they didn't deserve determine how he served he served as it honors god yes you know and that is that is often the challenge in ministry to know who called us and why we are serving so and you can oh. reference that all the time what your dad modeled but i i i'm sure he said to you it was modeled based on a call by god not by the church and that's a huge difference so good yes, I, okay yeah. yes okay um any more questions or comment <clears throat> before we um i could i could keep talking to you all morning darren but i know we have uh, another um presentation that comes so let me just ask any more questions or comment before we um shift gears mm -hmm. um i'm seeing a comment here my dad is an elderly yes um, okay yes i find a little they had little time for us once they saw right. the secular work and ministry work the children were the last thing right so so that again as i i would have alluded to um yes, because yes he immersed himself so much in the ministry there are things that i believe that we could have done like you would see other families do different things no mind you he tried his best to they do everything you know to try and create that balance but we know in life you know especially when you're 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 you're, you're passionate and your call is from god right the, the, that tends to, to 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 come through in a lot of ways so sometimes I, I I believe back then sometimes I I felt that um I felt a little robbed of having that that uh, much more intimate time having fun and going yeah. and doing all these things. Not to say that that wasn't done enough, but much more of that could have been done. But because yeah. of the demands of the church, and I think in that time where he was he was uh, making the transition. So um, um, he took on the role of a district superintendent, which required of him to avail himself, all right, having right, so right, many right. Um, churches that he had to oversee. It pulled on him a lot, right? So he had to go much more yes. often out there, right, and give yes. up himself. Like sometimes you would say, boy, daddy, you can't, you know, really stay here. But he had meetings. And of course, he had a church that people constantly call him. You know, calling him and looking towards him, pastor to give financial counsel, marital counsel, the every every forward thing that was a demand. And I'm like, no. So what happened to our time, like people? And I don't think. And I think the congregants at times need to be cognizant of 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 their pastor, right? And that the pastor yeah. have a life too. You know, so there's this constant pressure and this demand on this one man. And yeah, the man have a life and has a family too. So yes. that, that, in a way, was one of the, the, the other things, too, that I really didn't like at all. I didn't like one bit. Yeah. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you so much for you. sharing and sharing so honestly and openly, you know, about your journey and, you know, and, and uh, yeah. as a pastor's uh, child and you know and now here you are as an adult and you can reflect and you can talk about the ups and downs and how you know but you said something the yeah. grace of god has always been upon you and you know you will you have to stay the journey so we are so thankful for you taking the time to share with us and to be uh, uh transparent as you you know as you have been in letting us know what what the journey was like for you and as you can see um with all the challenges god has led you to where you are today so this time I'm going to invite um, Lisa to come and um, offer a word of prayer for you, Darren. Thank you. Thank you for having me, everyone. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we bless you. We thank you for this day that you have made that we choose to rejoice and be glad in. Father, thank you, Lord, for your own son, Darren Brown. Thank you for bringing him to this platform this morning to pour out and share honestly, God, on his journey as a pastor's son, God, from childhood to this point. Father, thank you so much for your hand upon his life, oh God, that has kept him through the hills and the valleys, oh God, through the, the 
mouths, the voices of congregants and even other pastors and persons outside of the church that said things that discouraged him, oh God. Father, thank you for keeping him, oh God, through the times where his father's uh, occupation with the things of you, oh God, may have cause some resentment, God. Father, thank you for taking him through that and bringing him, oh God, to this place where in his own right he is a minister. And so, God, I lift up this minister of yours to you for the spheres of influence, Lord, that you have placed him in even now. Thank you for your call upon his life, oh God. And Father, I pray that you, by your spirit, would lead him to continue to be the leadership in the different point of us to you, God. Father, let his life reflect you. Let your light shine through Darren Brown in every place that you lead him into, Father, in the name of Jesus. God, I call forth, Lord, every gifting that you have placed in this man to come forth, Lord, and flow in the exact ways that you want, in the timing that you want, in the places Lord, in the places that you want, oh God, let his voice be heard. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I pray not only for him and his family. God, I thank you even for giving him a good help meet, oh God, as he advances in this journey. Thank you for his own family as well, oh God, his children. And God, I pray that he will implement the lessons that he's learned from his journey, oh God, and cause it to be great balance, cause him to, yes, be focused on ministry, yes, be focused on work and these other things, but oh God, let his first ministry, oh God, be to his family, let the balance be there, cause him, oh God, to be the sort of father that raises up righteous seed that take their place in the kingdom in whatever you call them to, Father, in the name of Jesus. God, I also lift up all the other pastors' children on this platform, oh God. Father, I pray that you will encourage them, oh God, to walk in the vision that you have purposed for each one of them, God. Father, I come against every spirit of resentment and discouragement for any who had similar uh, journeys and occurrences like Darren and even those whose situations may have been worse. Father, I pray today that you will encourage every heart. Father, where there has been maybe unforgiveness because of the things they saw people do to their parents or the things they heard that their parents don't even know they heard about them and they had to defend or maybe couldn't even defend, Lord. Father, I pray you'd help them to release those persons, oh God, that they may have held in, in, in unforgiveness for so long, God. Father, I pray for every one of these pastor's children to come into their own, Lord. And God, I pray even for the younger pastor's children that may now be more enlightened in different ways than back in Darren's time, that they will know when to speak up, even share respectfully with their parents when they need to have their time as a family. So Father, I thank you for this opportunity and I pray your blessings, not only upon Minister Darren and his wife Kimberly and their family, but on every one of the pastor's children there, even or other uh, Upcoming presenter, Luke, God, just have your own way in each of them. Be near to them in all the ways that you want and lead them into the fullness of all you've called them to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Bless you, Martha. Thank you. Bless you. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Darren, for sharing. God bless you richly. It was a pleasure having you here with us. Bless you. Okay. And so we want to uh, invite our next uh, presenter. Uh, he, he is a very dynamic, young, we say young, motivational speaker. And 
he is, <laughs> yes, he is very, 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 very dynamic. You know, when you sit to listen to him speak, you know, you're captivated, you know, because of the perspectives from which the angles that he will bring out of the word of God. He helps persons to discover their purpose, to develop potential and to deploy their gifts. And so we're so very grateful for what he is doing in helping our young people in coming into their giftings and their callings. Uh, Pastor Luke Kwamina, uh, the son of Luke, uh, Cecil and Debbie Kwamina, we give God thanks for him. He ministers at the First Church of the Open Bible in San Fernando, Trinidad and Tobago. And I want to say thank you so much, Luke, for being here. Uh, on behalf of God's anatomy for marriage, we are very appreciative of your presence here today. May the Lord bless you richly as you share. Thank you. All right, thank you. And good morning to everybody. Hopefully you guys are hearing me clearly. If you can just let me. Let yes, me we're, yes, we're hearing you. All right, let me make sure that the sound Sound is good too? Yes, excellent. Yes. All right, perfect. Well, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Um, you know, little did I know that, you know, when I received this, um, the opportunity to be able to serve in this capacity, little did I know it would be the day after I laid uh, my mom's body to rest, and now she has transitioned into glory. Yesterday, you know, was the funeral. Uh, one week ago, um, my life would have changed forever when I would be in the room, when my mother would have, you know, breathed her last few breaths on earth, and I was involved in resuscitation, you know, um, as she struggled, you know, in her breathing, and I, we did everything that we could with the medical team that was here um, at my home. And um, about 15 minutes in, I told them, I said, let her rest. And so one week later, which was yesterday, Friday, you know, we had a service and, um, you know, we did what we needed to do to honor a general in the faith. Um, and a beautiful send off um, for what we could have done. You know, there are no words or efforts that we could have done that really, really um, would measure to what she has done, you know, in service for her God. So today um, is one day after. And if you know anything about my mother, she would tell me, get up and preach the gospel. Um, now is not time to slow down. Now it's time to speed up. And um, she was a woman of faith. And you'll hear a whole lot more about as I'll tell her story over and over and over again. But I just, I just want to share three things, very short. And I, I, like, the, I like the opportunity to answer questions. Um, you know, coming into the role of being the child of a pastor is a choice that you did not make for yourself. So, you know, very early in my days, I went through the phase of letting my parents know that because I did not choose this for myself and they chose this vocation, that somehow I felt I probably had some authority to rebel and make a choice now, you know. That didn't work out pretty well. <laughs> um, so there was a lot of resistance there. And then I was just hanging around, you know, let's just had a season of just being around. All this stuff is happening around me, not, in, not inside me. I know it's not, I know what not to say, I know what not to do, but I'm not plugged in and connected to the life of God. Until about 16 years old, my dad decides to send me to youth conference, Dr. Miles Monroe, Youth Alive. And I said, on the plane, I said, you know, the only reason I'm going to this conference is because I'm the pastor's son. 
There are other young people who are more deserving of this. Why would my father even select me? Now, I'm happy to go, but somewhere inside of me said, probably there were other young people who were more deserving than me. And I guess it's only because I'm the pastor's son he sent me. So that was my wisdom at the time. So I go and I made up my mind that I'm not going to listen to any sermon. I'm not here for that. I'm in Bahamas, I'm gonna relax, have a good time. I'm not plugged in and I made up my mind to not listen. And so I, that's what I did. I didn't listen to anything in the word. Sat down in the second row and just played the role. And then I said, after the service, I'll leave, meet a few friends and, you know, just chill. Anyways, the service ended and I said, okay, good. Let me wait till everybody kind of walk out first. Give it some time, people will be in the lobby. And then I will get up and go. So I'm sitting in the second row and I'm just there. And then I realize I can't move. Like I, I want to move my feet. I can't move my feet. I want to move my hands. I can't move my hands. The only thing that is moving are my eyes. But because I, I let everybody walk out first to give you know some space and time before I go out, there's nobody that I can point or indicate or say something to, to let them know my whole, my entire body went. I couldn't move. You know, it just went numb. I can't move. I can't do anything. So I'm just there. So my first thought is I got a stroke. <laughs> That's the only thing I, I thought really made sense. I got a stroke. And then I realized I start crying. Now, I'm crying, but internally I'm asking myself, well, Luke, why are you crying? Why are you crying? And the next thing I knew consciously was that Pastor Dave Burrows was waking me up from the floor. I was on the ground. He says, they call me Trini. Trini, you know, the bus is waiting to take you back to the hotel. They've been looking for you. I understand you've been on the ground here for over an hour. And when I tried to respond to Pastor Dave, I spoke in tongues for the first time. I had no control. So let's say you're trying to talk English, but you have no control over what you say. If you, you try to say something, it's changing your words into, you know, tongues. It was strange. So I said, it was embarrassing too. Let's say somebody say good morning. You say, Why so is this person so over spiritual and crazy? Say, look, do you want something to eat? It was, it was the only thing I could tell you that I drew reference to as one devotion, family devotion. My mother explained to me what it means to be drunk in the spirit. So I said, I have no control over my body. I have no control over my tongue. This is crazy in my mind. My carnal mind is saying, this is crazy. So I get back to the hotel and I said, I take a cold shower. I take a cold shower, it will wash it off. You know, you take a cold shower, it will, it will get you back to wherever. I take the cold shower, nothing works. And I remember lying down in the middle of the bed, curled up like in a fetal position, and I don't know what to do. I didn't use the hotel's phone to call my parents, expense, I'm just in this hotel room. And got up in the morning, can't speak in English, only speaking in tongues. I had a little bit of money my father gave me, and I went and I bought my Bible, the first Bible I bought for myself, which was an amplified Bible. And I sat down with that Bible and I read from Genesis to Jeremiah in one reading. When I get to Jeremiah, and this is an amplified Bible, so it's a little bit more to read as the amplified, right? Those of you who've read the amplified version. So when I got to Jeremiah 1 and 10, it says, I give you a sight of nations of kingdoms to root up, pull down, overthrow, to destroy, to build and to plant. And I couldn't read, read past the verse. I just... I couldn't read past the verse. I said, why, why is it I can't keep reading past this verse? 
And then I remembered what happened to me the night before because I had no recollection of what happened. Remember, I said I was crying and then the next thing I knew they were waking me up. It was a vision that I had with me lying on the ground and a big hand came out of the sky, went into my chest and start pulling out my organs. And a big hand comes back from the heavens, takes a sponge and stops the bleeding. And a big hand comes with new organs and plants them in me. And then it, it seals me up like I had a surgery that changed all my organs. Right? Can you hold one second, please? Can you hold one second? Hi, good morning. Hi, good morning. So anyway, the hand sealed me up. Hopefully I'm not boring you with this story. I'm going somewhere. <laughs> um, when I came back to Trinidad, I was never interested in ministry and stuff. But when I came back to Trinidad, I wanted to, pr I wanted to just pray. Somehow inside of me, I hung up a prayer. But I didn't know how to pray. So when I came to my parents and my dad, I said, Daddy, I would like to do a prayer with young people who are going to write exams. And he was talking to the youth pastor at the time. And I remember both of them go, it's the encourage that I want to take initiative in prayer, but it's like you asking to pray. <laughs> like we know you. I say, okay. So I made a deal with God. I said, whoever comes to this prayer, if what you did with me is real, because I didn't know how to talk to God. I didn't really... I didn't know the things of God. It was around me. Church was around me. I had no connection with God yet. Just under the covering of my parents. I said, I, I, want, I want to see if this that you did with me is real. If you allow the people who come to this prayer meeting, see if the same thing happened to them, then I know it's real. Because at that time, it was, it was like, it's crazy to me. I just didn't understand what was taking place. So when I received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, nobody placed their hands on me. So I don't want you to think. The reason I'm telling you that is don't make laws of the things of God. God has his laws. But don't make laws of the things of God. God wants something to happen. He'll find a way to make it happen. The, 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 the Christ, when Christ came, Christ did not have a traditional path of a baby being born, and doctors around and hospital. When God wants to make something happen, he'll make it happen. It might be comfortable. It might not be uh, excellent. It might be professional, but God will make a way where there seems to be no way. And God is able that means he has full ability and capacity. So don't think because you are not walking the traditional path that everybody thinks you should walk, that God's not going to bring you to the same place that he destined for you. I want to let you know that. Nobody laid their hands on me and nobody came in my ears and say, pray. And they prayed in tongues for me to pray in tongues. Nobody put oil on me. No, this was me and God encounter. That's why you can't convince me against the fact that you can be saved. And I know this for young people, I don't know the ages on here, but I'm old school in the sense where I tell you, it is the fundamentals that is lacking in the faith. The fundamentals. People think it's optional to be filled with the spirit. It's not optional. You cannot overcome. You cannot have a victorious life. You cannot do his will and his work if you are not filled with the spirit of God, it's not optional. So I still believe when I get amongst youth, I still believe that we ought to have these sessions where we make sure we put a priority on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's a life changer. All right. I'll read something for you at the end. Some very, very special. Remind me to. Four people came to the prayer meeting, even though a lot of them were writing exams. But you see, for Luke to say he's having a prayer meeting, it's almost like to say for Hitler to say he's having a crusade. 
it didn't make sense. They couldn't connect the two. The two did not go together. It was a strange call. So four people came and those four were my friends. So they really didn't have all the respect for me in ministry, but they were my friends and they were writing exams as well. So they said, all right, let's go pray. It's a good thing to pray. I didn't know how to pray. I didn't know corporate prayer. I didn't know how to pray with people publicly. I had no prayer life. At 16, I had no prayer life. So I told them, kneel down. They knelt down. I said, let's hold hands. We held hands. And I, I prayed a very baby prayer. It's like, dear God, I thank you today for the birds and the trees and the bees. I thank you that I am healthy and we are healthy. I just, I just thanking him. And in about four minutes, all four of them are on the floor talking in tongues. And I stopped praying. I got up. I stopped praying. I said, it's real. This thing is real. You, you did it for them. They, they are experiencing what I experienced in Bahamas. This is, this is real. So when they came out and I was there, talked to them, I said, I didn't tell them what I told God. When I was walking up the basement stairs, God said, are you going to come back? I said, come back. We just prayed for exams. Well, why do I need to come back? And he said, well, that's, that's, that's it. You just want to pray and come in my presence for me to bless you with a thing, with some results. He said, um, you're flirting. Come. I'm in a, I'm in a meeting. So flirting. So what do you mean? He says, well, when you're flirting, you just want a benefit. It's not about the other person. You want a benefit from them. He said, if you want relationship, come back. Regardless of your results, come back to me. And I said, I'll come back to you. So I started to go in that basement Friday after Friday to learn how to pray. And my friends decided to come back too. I told them I'm coming back. Three months later, we were over 300 young people in the basement, everybody filled with the Holy Ghost. Seven months later, we were over 900 young people praying on a Friday. Everybody filled with the Holy Ghost. So that's when my ministry started. And since then, um, it's just been a journey of faith. Uh, the three things I just wanted to leave with you before we have some questions. And, and there's a lot I can tell you about the journey of faith. God has performed great and mighty things. But in relation to, you know, the context of being the child of someone who's called by God, you yourself are called. All right? You yourself are called. The first thing, and, you know, I say this in, in, in respect to my mother. Um, in 2 Timothy 1 and 5, it says, I'm reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother, Lois, and in your mother, Eunice, and I am persuaded it now lives in you also. So the first thing I want to say to you is there are two sides to this thing, you know, in the role that you play. There is the blessing of it. Don't think that everything is hard with being part of a pastor's family. There's a lot of favor you receive. I hope you have. I hope you've received some type of favor. Where I show up in places I don't pay. I show up in places I get discounts. I show up in places I come to the front of the line. When they hear who my father is or they hear who my mother is, I show up in places and people say, ah, don't worry about it. There's a lot of blessings and favor to being the child of somebody who is blessed and, and, and has a good name and does well amongst others. A lot of respect that I get. The flip side of it is, uh, like I heard before, the challenges, the opposition, the criticism, to hear people say things about your mother or your father, it's hard. But I want to tell you one of the things that is very important for you to understand. There is something that lives in them that must live in you. 
there is a faith that lived in Lois that was transferred to Eunice, that was transferred to Timothy. And, 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 and Paul is, is like his spiritual, you know, uh, paternal um, uh, father or, of, you know, the person who took responsibility over him says, I want to stir up that thing that is inside of you. I'm seeing evidence of a faith that lived in your grandmother. It lived in your mother. And now I'm telling you, it lives in you. So everybody else does not have the same opportunity like you do. You have a privilege to be a, to, to, to receive a type of faith. Come on, somebody. All, not all faiths are made alike. If I tell you about my mother faith, one day, my father, I remember when we were a child, she, we would come home and she'd go like this. And, and, and my father says, Debbie, we haven't gotten all the money as yet to carry the kids to Disney World. Don't create false expectations of them. And my mother said, okay, Cecil. But every day we came home, she goes, because my father felt until he bought the tickets, he did not want to create an expectation because if he couldn't get the tickets for us to go and the visa and everything else, then he doesn't want to excite us. And that, that is practical. But that was not my mother's faith. My mother faith was you celebrate long before you have the money. You celebrate long before you have the tickets. You celebrate long before you have the visa. She knew her God was going to come through. She was sure of God more than she was sure of the money. She was sure of his word more than she was sure of the visa. She was sure of, uh, of God's commitment to her and her family more than she was sure of the passport. He, she was sure of what God told her. So my father was playing it safe. But the just was not called to live safe. The just was called to live by faith. Not play it safe, by faith and not by sight. That's how we were called. My mother, we got the money. My father felt a little bit settled. Everybody got their visa and stuff except my mother. This is one week away. She has not gotten her visa. And she starts packing the suitcases. My father said, Debbie, now listen, I know we're going, but we may not be going on Friday. Don't pack the suitcases until we could get everything settled. And then otherwise now the kids are going to think we're going on Friday and we're not going to go on Friday because your visa might not be here on time. Again, he's playing it safe. He think he's trying to protect us. But my mother is displaying how faith works. Come on, somebody. If something lives in them, it can live in you. You have a privilege today that there's a type of faith. Come on, not just faith, a type of faith. Do you know the faith that Abraham had? He was old. The Bible says his Sarah was 99, never had a child. Her womb had never brought birth, but he considered not the deadness of his own body, nor the deadness of Sarah's womb. He believed in God. He did not stagger at his promises. That's a type of faith. Don't tell me that's regular believing. When Jesus saw the centurion, he says, I've never seen this type of faith before. This is a great faith. This is not a little faith. This is not a small faith. This is not a regular faith. This is a great faith. Why? You told me, don't even come to the house, master. Just speak. And my servant is going to receive healing. Why? Because I understand authority. I tell people, come, and they come. I tell them, go, and they go. If you just say it out of your mouth, he said, look, this right here is the greatest faith I've seen. Why? This is a model of faith. It is a measure of faith. It is an accomplishment of a type of faith. So my mother said, look, Cecil, you were worried about the money. Do we have the money now? Good. Now you're worried about the day and my visa. The same God that provided the money for the tickets. Come on, somebody. Put a one in the chat if you're with me this morning. It's the same God that's going to provide the visa on time. Put a one in the chat if you want that type of faith. You want to believe God like never before. You have a privilege to be the seed of somebody who carries a type of faith in the earth. Not regular faith. 
The people with no faith, the people with faith. No, the people with no faith, the people with little faith, the people with faith, and the people with great faith. My mother had great faith. She is in the hall of faith in Hebrews 11. Deborah was added. I know that yesterday. Deborah was added in the hall of faith. You remember that name. We don't have the visa on Friday. But we are on our way to the airport because my mother said, God will provide. Come on, somebody. I, I got to tell you, it, it is crazy the things that she did. She made my father pack a bag, suitcases, in a car with no passport and visa for her, but all three of us have. My father said, I'm not going on the plane with the kids without you. Yeah, B, this is crazy. What are you doing? This does not make sense. He's already prepared to turn around and come back home. Why? Because he's not going to go. They're going to miss the flight. They're going to change the dates, but he's going to do it. Why? It is her faith. Come on, somebody. Your faith will make you whole. Not somebody else's faith. And there might be people with your last name that don't carry your faith. But your faith will make you whole. Faith is personal. It's my experience with God. I killed a lion. I killed a bear. That's why when I know I go to face Goliath, God has given me a faith. He's given me a faith, a type of faith this morning. And I know God's going to help me to conquer this uncircumcised Philistine. Why? Because of where I've been with God. You have the ability to capture a type of faith. Grandmother Lois, Mother Eunice, that same faith is in you. Come on, somebody. It might be in its seed stage, but it is in you. They got to the line to check in. Two more people to finish checking. The plane is already almost filled. Kwamina? Kwamina? Is there any Kwaminas here? Yes, Kwamina. This package came from the embassy. It has a passport for Deborah Kwamina. Is there Deborah Kwamina here? Yes, can you show me some ID? Look, you, you find a way to explain to me how the embassy is sending a package. To, never has it ever happened in history. But she had proof that her flight was what day it was. The embassy had it. They got her passport to the, come on, I'm going to run this morning if you don't want to run. There is a type of faith in the earth that could believe God at his word. I'm trying to inspire and encourage somebody this morning that you have the ability to have a faith this morning in the word of God. Don't let anybody else tell you differently. When Jairus was bothering Jesus, one of the synagogue leaders says, stop bothering the master. Your daughter is already dead. Jesus captured those words out of the atmosphere and says, you not. Only believe your daughter. Only believe and she will be well. She will be healed. She will be alive. Yeah, a lot of people can keep coming to attend you. Don't bother. That faith is not going to work. Don't bother Jesus. I'm telling you this morning, bother Jesus. So that's the first thing. You have a privilege. There's a type of faith that can be in you because of the spiritual bloodline. Sometimes it might not be yeah, happening physically. Sometimes we lose parents in the physical. But God, my mother was adopted. So she did not get it from her blood mother. She got it from the missionaries who adopted her. So even those who don't have parents, if a mother or father even forsake you, or if you're an orphan, God will place you in a family. There is something that can be transferred in your life. Let me tell you this really quickly because I know we want some questions. The Bible says also in Joshua 1 and 1. Now, after the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spake to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant. Now, Joshua was a spiritual son of Moses. His real father's name was Nun, but he served Moses like a father. What happens? There is legacy that continues in you. After death, God still speaks. Put it to in the chat if you believe that. After death, 
God still speaks. I'm standing here this morning to tell you that my, I buried my mom yesterday. And guess what? God spoke this morning. So something in her that began in her is going to finish in me. Something that began in me is going to finish in Judah's life. Something that begins in Judah's life is going to finish in his life. Faith is transgenerational. Faith is a relay. Faith is legacy. You're going to run a, a, a part of the race, but the race will continue after you die. And let me say this, you've got to run a good leg. I'm challenging you this morning, run a good leg for your parents. Run a good leg with those God has connected you. Run a good race. I had to fight the fight. She finished her race. She kept her faith. Now she has a crown in heavenly places. Well done, Deborah. Well done, Deborah. Good and faithful. So there are things that God allowed her to see with her eyes. Deuteronomy 20. Things she will see with There's not an end. Death is a transition. You must know the things in your parents' heart that God has established because after they die, you must continue because God will, the same God. I think it is in 1 Kings chapter 2 when David, the Bible says, uh, 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 the time came for David to die. So he gave these commands to Solomon. I'm about to die like all men must. But you are growing stronger and you must become a man. Hmm. This is what David is saying to his son before he dies. He said, now carefully obey all the commands of the Lord your God. Carefully obey all his laws, his commands, his decisions, and his agreements. Obey everything that is written in the law of Moses. If you do this, you will be successful at whatever you do and wherever you go. So your parents will give you the formula. For when they pass on, you can walk in the same ways, the same laws, the same commands, make the same decisions and the same agreements, and you too can have prosperity. But watch this, greater things shall you do. If you do this, you will be successful at whatever you do and wherever you go. Verse 4, and if you obey the Lord, he will keep this promise about me. That means God, will, God has promised some things to your parents. That will extend to you. Here was a promise. He said, if your sons carefully live the way I tell them, sincerely with all their heart, the king of Israel will always be a man from your family. There are promises that will outlast you and bless generations to come. There are promises that will bless the, 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 the generation that is still in your loins. The word of God will jump from one generation and go on to the next. And this was a formula that David was giving his son long before he closed his eyes. And can I say this? Get the formula when their eyes are open. <laughs> I have one more thing to share with you, but I'm not going to share it just for, for time. Get the, look. Put a four in the chat if you know what I'm saying. Get the formula while their eyes are open. Because when their eyes are closed, you can't get it. You better have a sit down with your mom. Sit down with your dad. Say, daddy, give me the formula. Ha -ha, write them down. Put pen to paper. Guess what? I got the formula from my mother while her eyes were open. And that's why this morning I can get up in faith. Huh? So I'm just, that's a snippet. The snippet is there's a lot of there's a lot I've left out in between. All I want to encourage you is that that the balance of life is that where there is blessing, there will always be sacrifice. You go study the Bible by his stripes. We are healed. You see stripes, you say, well, the Lord has turned his back on them. Oh, the, 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 the Lord has, uh, the hand of the Lord is, you say, uh, uh, Naomi, Naomi, the Lord has, has, has been bitterly against me. She was in the pain. But, but she did not know she was walking into a valley harvest. See, guys, I want you to know, we must interpret the things of God with the mind of God. That's why his ways are higher than our ways because his thoughts 
if your thoughts are not high, you will not understand the ways of God because his ways are high. When you have low thinking, you cannot understand high ways. Lord just gave me that. When your thinking is low, earthly, carnal, and you're trying to interpret the way of God, you cannot interpret the way of God. It is too far beyond a finite mind to interpret. It must be given to you by the spirit of God, revealed. Flesh and blood cannot give you that. It must be revealed by the spirit of truth. So today, am I, am I in pain because my mother is gone? Absolutely. Do, do, would I know that I feel in one sense a lasting loss? Absolutely. You can't replace somebody like my mother. Irreplaceable, really. And you know, I was at the funeral and different things and people may have seen and says, well, Luke, you are strong. And some people even thought my strength was inauthentic. See, you can't, you, you can't be personally lost a, a mother and not, not look like it. And I read, I, I want to read something for you. This is the letter that my mother wrote applying to become a minister in the Open Bible Organization very early. I, I want you to hear this. And, and then, we, then we're done. I'm done. I'm done. I, could, I could share a lot about you, but, you know, because of the time in my life, the emotions run hard. I talk a lot about my mother. I used to talk a lot about my father. I'm going to talk a lot about my mother. Listen to this. I was saved at the age of 14. She typed this typewriter. And I think I see Auntie Pearl here, who was a co-worker of, I think it's Auntie Pearl, a co-worker of hers, and they worked together. And Auntie Pearl could give you a lot of history that I can't give you. But Auntie Pearl, you're going to love this one. I was saved at the age of 14 under the ministry of Reverend Edward Wood. It was a Tuesday night during the month of August 1964 when I gave my life to Christ. He completely changed me by the power of God. My life has not been the same since. Three months after I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, God has been good to me all these years. My ministerial activity started while I was in Bible school. I was a youth leader in my church. I had many opportunities to speak. I taught a class in Sunday school every Sunday a.m. in San Fernando Church, and then on Sunday p.m. in La Romaine. My Bible school class had an evangelistic team which went out frequently to outpost. After graduation, I went to the United States for almost two years. At that time, I ministered every Sunday. Most of those times, I ministered in open Bible churches. Since my return to Trinidad, I'm employed at the First Church of the Open Bible in San Fernando. Presently, I'm a youth leader, Sunday school teacher, choir member, and I help in Mountain Movers services from time to time. My main ministry is in our senior junior church with children age 11 to 15 as choir director of the senior junior church choir. You know, I heard my mother say how many things she was doing, but what stood out to me was the humility in which she presented it. You know, she wasn't saying, look at all these things that I do. She just simply was saying, these are all the things that I do. And it was a powerful lesson for me of having all the power to defend yourself like Christ on the cross, that you humble yourself as a lamb led to the slaughter and you keep at your lips. And rather you say, Father, forgive them. Or they know not what they do. That's what I saw. Rather than use my words to respond 
to what I think is affecting me. I will use my words to bless the Lord or to forgive or to be kind or to lift up. That was my mother. So what you have heard from me today, I take no credit. I take no glory. Only the Lord alone is strong. Only the Lord alone is wise. He that claimeth to be those things, claimeth that in ignorance. The flesh is weak. We cannot be strong. But in the spirit and the presence of the Lord, we can be strong in him. So I'm open to some questions. Um, any questions that you may have. I hope that what I shared in little, I didn't want to finish because of time, but in little, um, that it would bless you. Today, I'm just here as, a, as, as running in the race, uh, and the, you know, the legacy of faith. That is what continues today. And that's really what I wanted to share with you, more to, to highlight the blessings and the privilege and the benefit of where you stand. Guys, let me tell you something. Don't cry about the pain or the sacrifice. We see it differently. God did not spare his only son. So don't ask him to spare you. There will always be purpose in pain. If the pain be in the obedience to the things of God. There's a type of pain that will bring no benefit to you. And that is in disobedience to the things of God. When you suffer, that is the response to disobedience. But when you suffer for the things of God, there's a type of glory. And there is a type of of power that comes out of those things. So if you're going to suffer and experience pain, make sure that it is in alignment with you following the will of God. All right? So I love you. Thanks for the opportunity to share, and I'm open to any questions now. Thank you, Pastor Komen, uh, for just opening our hearts to the word. And before we take any questions, I feel that you've spoken to this platform and, and I would like you to lead us in a time of prayer. Let me say how I want, I, want to, what I want to highlight. One, you talk about when you were experiencing the things of God outside of you rather than in you. And you talk about the faith that was passed on from a grandmother to a mother to a son. And so there are people in this platform here, probably their parents, their pastors, who want to make sure they pass that faith on in the right way to the kids. Amen. And there are kids who are in here who are probably experiencing faith outside of them, not in them. And so I want you to, if you don't mind, to leave us in a time of prayer to hear how brave you talk about what your mother passed on to you. And you're right, you know. Um, yes, there's the pain of the loss and our, our heartfelt condolences from this platform to you Thank and your you. family. Um, but then there is the joy of knowing that there is a greater purpose to all of this. So Amen. would you... Please, it just kind of leaves in time of prayer for, for these places in which you spoke to us today. You spoke to my heart today about the kind of faith. You know, you challenged me about the kind of faith. Uh, your mother with this whole going to Disneyland thing, but what kind of faith do I have? So mm. pray for us first, and then we'll come back to the question. I feel right now we're in a place where our hearts are ready, and we, uh, we want to hear God in our hearts as you, as you pray for us. Then we'll come back to the question. Amen. Amen. Father, this morning we thank you. Oh God, we rely on you. I am weak in your presence, but when I come into your presence, you make me strong. I thank you. I don't know every face, every name. I don't know every, every person that is on here today, but what I do know is that you know from the grain of hair that is on my head, you know, you knew me in my mother's womb. You know every single one of them in their, in their mother's womb. Oh God, just like a, a coat of many colors would be knitted. So you fearfully and you wonderfully made each and every one of us. We trust you fully. We trust your will. We trust your ways. And God, we are amongst those who have been selected. Oh God, to walk a path that is not to be compared to any other path. You know, God, the sacrifices and the burdens. You know, the pain. You know, God, Father, the weight. You know, God, the pressure of wanting to look a certain way, sound a certain way, be a certain way. God, you understood it. And, and, and because you've placed us in this place, I know from my own experience, God, you've given a grace to walk in the calling 
that you have called us to do. There is a grace that is available. It's not by might nor by power. But it is by the spirit of the living God. And today I pray in your own unique way. In your own unique way. Stir up the gifts this morning. Stir up the faith this morning. Let your right hand be extended from heaven that is not short, that it cannot reach, nor is your air deaf that you cannot hear. Spirit of God, move this morning in the midst of them, at their homes, in the car, wherever they are. I pray in the name of Jesus that the power of God will transform this morning. Break where you need to break. Wash where you need to wash. Cause return where needs to be returned. Cause redemption, cause a stirring up, cause a new passion to flow. I pray in the name of Jesus that you will touch them in a special way. They are a brand plucked out of the fire, called to do great things in the earth, called to prophesy and to preach, to lead and to pastor, to love and to care, to evangelize, just like you said in Luke chapter 10, I send you everywhere where I will come. May we, O oh God, Father, be the ones uh, just like John the Baptist that will go out uh, into the highway and the byway, the streets and the fields, uh, wherever there is darkness, uh, to call out, O oh God, to those uh, and say that Jesus is coming soon, uh, that the Lord God Almighty is the way, uh, the only way. I pray, O oh God, that we'll be ambassadors of your presence. Uh, Make, oh God, Father, them have a passion to take full responsibility of the call. For, oh God, we will be, oh God, I know, doubly blessed when we take up our cross. Whoever has given up mother or father, if you have given up houses, you give up brother, you give up sister, whatever you give up, I want you to know there is reward in him. More will be granted unto you. Those who are discouraged this morning, thank you for your power and for your anointing. The oil of joy this morning over your head. I pour it in the spirit. I pour the oil on your head this morning. You can't run from this calling. You got to face this thing. You can't run away from who God has sent you to overcome every giant that comes will become your footstool. God will promote you by the things that oppose you. I pray in the name of Jesus this morning, let the oil of the anointing flow and let that anointing break every yoke. I pray you will turn rebellion into soft humility this morning. I pray you, you, you turn doubt into quiet truth this morning. Touch them by your power, by your grace. Let the faith be transferred, the anointing, the giftings, the understanding. Fresh in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Luke. Thank you for leading us in this time. And um, so I, I, I have a lot of questions for you, but let me open first to the platform and let people feel free to engage with you. Uh, a question or comment you want to make, um, please uh, feel free to um, do that now. Open your mic if you desire or put it in the chat, but um, uh, Luke is ready to answer your question. Okay, well, I'm trying to think about the question. Let me just ask this one of you because I think this is pivotal. You talked about um, you don't have to turn the things of God into law. You know how you came to the baptism and that your own journey. Um, say a little more about that because I think that's one of the challenges, even in in, in the home, uh, in the in the past. Is the pastor uh, sometimes expect the kids to re replica what their experiences have been, and if they don't see it, then they think that the you know that the children is not walking with the Lord or, or not doing what they wanted to do. Talk a little about. How, how we can make room for God to be God rather than closing these boxes that we expect people to show up in. Right. I would love if some of the parents were on here because there's a book that I'm we have to release. Yes. We have some parents. Yes. Good. Yes. yes. And the recordings, I'm sure, can be shared. 
you have to ask yourself, is it more, is it more about how people would see us based on what our children do and choose and live? Is it more about how we would be seen versus about what our kids are actually going through? Because in the early, I thought emphasis was more about how they would be seen, their reputation, what people would say. And I felt they went past me and they first defended position, the church, all of that. Now, I was the type of child that can speak to with very strong transparency, yet still be respectful and honorable. And my parents gave me the opportunity to do that. So I confronted that type of response to me because God blessed me with that ability. When I got filled with the Holy Ghost, Jeremiah, I, it was to root up, pull down, overthrow, destroy, then to build and to plant. That was my life's message. So when something is being put up that shouldn't be put up, it will be pulled down. That's my anointing. If it's buried, I'll root it up. There's a confrontation part, but then there's a healing part, which is to build and to plant. So one of the first things is you have to, you have to show your children that what they're going through and your love for them is more important than what people think. I know that's easier yeah. said than done, but I'm telling you, that's who yeah. my mother was. So you, th there's a level of flexibility. You cannot be rigid with righteousness. Rig rigidity is going to create rebellion. You have to have a safe place for, because, and, and here's the next thing. You have to be open about your trials and tribulations. Because if, if, you don't, if you're not clear with them that you struggled, some parents don't like to share struggles. They don't like to share struggles because they think that they will lose, their kids may lose respect and honor for them, but it's the other way around. I'll tell you of a story that happened. My father and I had a, we fought, literally. Well, I didn't fight him back, but I, def I defended myself. And he was coming to correct me on a Saturday evening. And at one time he took his elbow and he put it to my neck. And then my mother came, something my mother called him and says, Luke is being disrespectful. He came home without explanation. He was angry, upset, and he came at me with a belt. I held the belt, and when I pulled it, he kind of off balance, and then he physically manhandled me. His, his, his elbow is to my neck. My mother said, all right, Cecil, that's enough. About Sunday morning, about 4 a.m., I see the silhouette by my bed. My father's kneeling down over me said, son, I want to ask you to forgive me. I want to apologize. I didn't like what happened between us, and I'm sorry. See, I can't go and preach this morning with me feeling like this towards you. Now, my father is a little less than six feet, but that morning he was 10 feet tall. You know why? because it wasn't pastor preaching. It was my dad who apologized to me, who said, sorry, he was wrong. That's the level of transparency that we had. He, he didn't care too much that he would be preaching that morning and everybody saying, Happy, hallelujah. He cared about the one son that was sitting in there who could not respect him because I felt the encounter was, he cared more about me that impressing everybody else. That, that, that's, that's the type of, when, when we related to each other like that, we now became a unit as a family and we stuck together to defend the family against everything else that was coming against. It wasn't the church first, what they're going to say. In the beginning, it was like that. But then my father and they, they realized, no, it's the family first. It's what my son feels. My father would, you know, he preached a first service when I went through a broken engagement. And then he jumped on a flight that Sunday, left church, didn't do second service, didn't do the evening. He came up with me. I said, Daddy, you know, you could have come here. He said, no, I'm going to come today. I said, why? He said, let's just hang out. 
He didn't preach, didn't give me no word, didn't get, he said, let's go in the mall and shop. Then he told me, he says, you know, I have plenty of fish in the sea, you know. I remember going through a broken gate. He said, I have plenty of fish in the sea. I said, Daddy, that's not funny. He said, yeah, I'm telling you, I have plenty of fish in the sea. Then he tells me about his experience going through broken heartedness when he, you know, lost the relationship. There has to be that truth of transparency and sharing. It can't be we're doing it well here and y'all are keeping us back. Look at what you're doing. Look at how you're dressing. Look at how you're talking. Look that you're not in church. Look that you're doing that. Look how you're doing that. And you feel like y'all are embarrassing us and putting us under pressure and all of that. I confronted that. I didn't like comparisons. I didn't like any of that. So there was a level of truth between us. And let me tell you this. You know how the Lord fixed me? He made sure every step of commitment I did, nobody pressured me to do that. Mm -hmm. You ever hear people getting filled with the Holy Ghost? I mean, I, no, nobody say, Luke, you need to get filled with the Holy Ghost. Lord, just wait for me in Bahamas and say, tell. when I, I questioned God about that, I said, how could you fill me? And I did not ask you. He says, he says, who made you? He said, I couldn't let you go one more day without this. I needed to get you by myself. You know why? Because you would have said somebody else talk to this person. You know, your parents just talk to people to talk to you. I know when everybody who come to talk to me gets sent by my parents. How many of you know that? Put a four in the chat. If you know, they send somebody for you. And the person come in and say, hi, how are you doing? You know, the spirit of the Lord was just, I was just praying this morning. But you know, if you, I say, listen, you can't fool me. You know? I know you wouldn't you use it. I know you get sent. The Lord didn't do it that way for, 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 for baptism of the Holy Spirit. He caught me by myself. So that is the type of relationship I would say right. you have to develop with your children. Talk more. Right. And let me tell you this. When my mother was sick there, remember, they say twice a child, who do you think is going to take care of you? Who do you think is going to take care of you? I cleaned my mother, bathed my mother. It came down to the point where she couldn't do anything for herself. Is your children. And let me tell you one of the reasons why I have a peace today. No regrets. Folks, let me say this to you. And take my, take my encouragement today. Go and clear the slate with your parents. You don't know when the hour is. Don't have one more I love you that you wish you should have said. And don't have one I am sorry that you wish. I have no regrets with my mother. That is why I could have my mother and she, I have no regrets. I did everything for my mother she wanted, everything. As a matter of fact, the next day when I broke down before the Lord, you know what I told the Lord? I said, listen, my mother don't wait in lines. I said, when my am around, my mother don't open my door for herself. If she's stepping down a step, I hold in her hands. I said, my mother wants soup at 10.30, 10.45, she had the soup. I said, I want the same treatment for her. I said she had favor with man, but I wanted her favor with God. When she goes up there, I went, I said, I want favor for my mother. And then I heard my mother's voice say, look, you cannot play demands on God. And then I said, to, you know, I responded. I said, well, I'm making a strong appeal this morning. And I prayed for her, you know, I prayed for her. She was gone, but I prayed that God will show her favor. And then it's almost like I saw interaction with her and Christ. And Christ was almost saying to her, well, who is this boy? And she said, that's my son. He, that is how he looks out for me. That is how he prayed for me. Even in my death, he, you know, he has my back. So I'm just saying to you guys, that has to come from a real transparent relationship amongst each other. And you know, there's a powerful statement my father said to me as a child, and I'll close it with this and get next question. I need your walk, and you need my walk. Uh, before, you used to think it's all about your parents, but it's all, you also are important to your parents' ministry. My father used to say, Luke, you need me to walk right because I will put you under pressure if I'm a pastor and doing foolishness. 
it will put the children under pressure and the family. But I also need you to walk right because you will put me under pressure if you walk a certain way. It is mutual. Don't think that you're not important. You're very important. It goes both ways. It's mutual responsibility to walk uprightly before the Lord. And don't try to do it by might nor by power. There is a grace that is sufficient. But you surrender and you lean on the Lord and he will help you. Amen. Pastor Karim, um, yes. can I just make a, a comment, please? Yes, sure. Um, many years ago, we, we have two daughters. I'm the, I'm the wife of a, a pastor. And um, our children met Luke. I think it was in the um, all night prayer for the young people. But anyway, they spoke highly of this young man. I didn't know his father. And over the years, yeah, they spoke about him. But yesterday, um, at the funeral, whilst I was looking at um, excerpts of, I saw this young man. I think, I think this is the first time I'm seeing him. But when those children spoke of him, they spoke well. And today, you know, yesterday, when I looked at him, um, even his mother, I don't know his mother well either. There was a... a a glow, a spiritual glow that came out of this family when that funeral was taking place yesterday. And today in hearing him, I must commend him for the honor that he has shown to his parents. It is an honorable thing for you to say what you said there today. Um, to pastor's children because sometimes, yes, indeed, they are, they feel they are under pressure. But I want to commend you for what you have said today and to thank you very much for being obedient unto the Lord. Our children, um, they have the same type, they got the same type of um, training as you did. And uh, today we are grateful because they honored they honored, well, especially their father, they honored their father well. But I must commend you today, Lou, yeah. for what you have done and continue to keep in the will of God that you will, you know, your belief and your behavior will show to the world that indeed you are a, a disciple of God and a disciple of your, under your, your parents and now your, yeah. your father, and then to raise your children um, in loving your wife to show to the PKs of Trinidad and Tobago, that Amen. yes, God is indeed real. God bless you, son. Thank you. And be strong in the Lord. Amen. Okay, anyone else, please? Feel free, put it in the chat or ask a question. Hi, hi, Luke. Um, I'm, we have never met. Uh, this is Marlon Nichols, and um, I'm sitting. I'm sitting now listening to you. Are you hearing me? Yes. I'm sitting now listening to you because um, we our 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 journey is uh, very similar, but my journey, create in in other words. I'm hearing you, but but my journey actually helped where you are now. If if if, if it make any sense by the time I'm done. Mm -hmm. um, originally from Trinidad, um, and um, many years ago, the Lord had me set up something called Highest Praise, right? And Highest Praise literally groomed young worship leaders and pastors' children um, to be prepared for ministry. So we 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 be just concentrated on teaching and worship, but towards the pastor's children. Years after, um, I became the marketing director for Miles Monroe. So I took that into Youth Alive. Wow. And we decided that we will concentrate on Youth Alive, making sure we intercede for the children of the pastors who are coming. Listen, so, so now I'm, I'm hearing you talking <laughs> and um, I'm realizing that out of the concentration of what 
what God had done for all these years and, and emphasizing that this is what we needed to do because we, we literally created platforms from Youth Alive to, to ASAF, to all these different countries we did. We created the platforms and we specifically told the intercessors that we are, we are praying for the legacies of the children who are coming of pastors and leaders. So there was an anointing that resonated, especially in Youth Alive, that I could actually see the heaviness that will throw you on the floor. I could literally see it. Um, and I could understand why it was done, obviously, because there is, there is something else that had to be accomplished that I'm hearing you talk. And I'm realizing there's a, there's a, there's a, a, necess a necessary spiritual slap that you had to get um, at that point in time. Yeah. So, so I'm, 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 I'm connecting all the dots. And I remember one year we came to, um, to Trinidad while I was still in the, the Dr. Monroe. And we had a, a session at your church. And, um, and I, I guess we first time actually met, well, like I call him Uncle Cecil, like how I call people quite yeah. respect. Yes. And, um, and, he, and he came to the table and he, and he said to us, thank you. Now, I, I, I didn't understand the dynamics of, the, of the, 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 the thank you part of it. I never did, obviously. But um, I am understanding now what God really did. And I appreciate, mm. I guess, your openness. And as well as for me personally, the connecting of the dots as to how God orchestrates things. The steps of the righteous are ordered by Order. God. Amen. So from, from my, I guess, tenure with highest praise to, so all the things I had to do, I remember there's a specific time in my life in age 18, when um, I was a part of a singing group called um, NY Men in Trinidad. And, um, for the, and I had this, this, this hunger for more that I wasn't getting, but I, and, and I, I literally walked to, to um, Peter Reddy's church one Sunday morning. And while standing there, I was feeling really trip without anybody touching me also. But right after that, the Lord gave a vision. He said, I've called you of a Joshua generation, not what is being aired abroad now, but one who learns from the mystics of your leaders and one who becomes a leader by example. I never forgot that. And so my life has been where I, I, I teach as well as I interact and assist churches, that's my, that's my job. And that foundation is what we do, where we actually concentrate on making sure that there's no hypocrisy when a pastor goes home. That's why I emphasize so much that even in married couples, that you, you it makes an, a, a, an impression on your children when you, when, you, when, you, when you live a lie as a believer. So I am so impressed. I am so overwhelmed. Oh to hear and to see as uh, to what Uncle Cecil, and I never met your mother, but obviously there is such a divine type of, 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 of awe that I, I sense as a result of her. And the, the, there was no hypocrisy. Wow. When, I, when I heard that many men, when, when, when Uncle Cecil got down to, 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 to ask forgiveness, yes. that is probably one of the most divine things that could ever happen in a, in a, in a house. Mm -hmm. So my friend, I mean, I know we never met, but this this will be the beginning of a lot of things that we're going to do together. Yes. Like, um, yes. Um, so so I, I I really am impressed by what God has done, and I I I, I guess put a stamp of heavenly approval on on the authenticity of this this moment. I think because yes. you can sense the presence of God in, on the platform. Yes. Yes. You know, and so I just want to say thank you. I mean, Errol. I mean, Ruth. As again and again. You know, obviously, there's no plan, but we, we have we have the planner, Amen. You know, and he himself is doing this thing. So, so my friend, I I I applaud you for your honesty and your openness. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else comments, observations? Minister Luke, good afternoon. It's great sitting under your ministry um, today. I have actually known of your ministry since back in the days when you were a teen and sang real, real, and I've listened to you in a number of forums. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, I want to ask you to share, especially with the young people, how do you deal with relationships with the opposite sex as a young pastors get in the light of where people come to you with let's say funny intentions some seem deliberately sent to trip you up can you speak to that please thanks many blessings okay good well i think now when i got filled with the holy spirit right now i'll tell you before that i got filled with the holy spirit at 16 before that, remember this, if you're trying to walk and overcome in spiritual things and you do not have, a, to me, I think you, you really do not have an, you're at a disadvantage when you're not filled with the Holy Spirit. Because to not fulfill the deeds of the flesh, you got to walk in the Spirit. There's, you can't not, you can't try to not do the things in the flesh. You know? That's not what you put your effort in. You have to put your effort into the things of God. Your defense is your offense. Your offense in the things of God. How do you punish disobedience? With obedience. So the Bible says you, you have to punish the disobedience with what? Obedience. So you have to put your attention. But if you don't have that infilling of the Holy Spirit, I almost think it's unfair. Because when I, before getting filled with the Holy Spirit, I thought to beat lust, you have to not look at things that could trigger lust. Don't look at a mag. And back in the day, the only thing that came in in high school was a newspaper locally called a Sunday Punch. We didn't have access to like magazines. We don't have access to internet. I'm 42. I know it sounds crazy, but you don't have access to anything on phones. It's only if somebody brought a magazine or a newspaper with that. So you've all you're seeing how people dressed in society. So I started to put my efforts into not looking at things like that rather than looking into the word of God. You're thinking that if you don't see the source, you will, but then I realized that don't work because that is a carnal effort at overcoming a spiritual thing. When I got filled with the Holy Spirit, I felt I was walking in a bubble. What does that mean? Even when I saw the things, something was, there was a presence of truth that creates conviction that allows you to, it almost felt like it didn't have the same power on me. And I remember having this thought that says, I said, this, why nobody didn't tell me this? So all the time I'm trying by effort. I did not know this thing called the Holy Ghost is so powerful. I did not know I could be in and amongst this ungodliness and still live godly because there's an infilling of the Holy Ghost that is an empowerment for you, that people could be cursing around you, saying whatever, drinking around you, but you can move with the presence of God like an ambassador and you influence them instead of them influencing you. I saw a friend long time, uh, he worked at a TV station and he's making a joke to a coworker and saying, yeah, they used to call me Kwame. He says, yeah, boy, we didn't really like Kwame. You know, the man used to come and just, and when we're playing soccer, you know, everybody talking about girls, this, whatever. And they used to say, I come and mess up the whole, the whole talk because I come in in the midst and I say, Sammy, that's what you want? That's what you do. Say, when Kwame come, the whole thing just mash up. And now I come and turn this whole thing into a God talk, right? That's what he said. But the truth was, I realized with the power of the Holy Ghost, I can get in the presence and I'm influencing them instead of them influencing me. So when, it came, when I got filled, something changed about my personality. I became very sincere about the things of God. And sincerity repels folly. I don't know if it may happen to you, but I just let you know. When people know you're serious in the things of God, it will repel folly. That take care of probably 90% of all the folly that will be around so a very, it doesn't mean you have to be like a, you know, so serious that nobody can hang around, but sincerity in the things of God. Yeah. Like, they won't play. I, I became so transparent. Like, girls who had written me letters, I used to hand my mother that and say, Mommy, read that and see what they're saying there. 
And these girls didn't know that I was handing these letters to my mother. So my mother was informed. And that is the level of transparency we had. No hiding, no hiding. My parents always trusted me because there was no hiding. I like somebody, I like somebody. Call somebody, they let me go anywhere, wherever, because Luke will tell. There's no hiding with me, all right? So that is one. Now, for the other remain outside of your sincerity, there is a thought. Now, remember, I was not mature in the things of God. So God used simple things to get through, to get great things understood to me. Simple things he uses because I was not mature in the things of God. So he said to me, Luke, whatever you do with young ladies, I will allow men to do with your daughters. I never had a daughter at that time. Well, you think about it. No, that's not a scripture, you know. That's just something God told me to give man understanding. You think about that as a man. Whatever you do with a young lady, God will allow men to do with your daughters. What would you want to do with young ladies? Respect them, honor them, treat them well, care. Only do, meaning my actions towards young ladies will be seeds and the harvest will, will be seen in my children. I don't know about anybody else, but that gave me a level of conviction that made me live very circumspect. Wow. That was the second layer. The first layer was sincerity with the things of God. The second layer was a revelation of what you sow in those times, you can reap later on. The third layer was prayer. Prayer, prayer, it, it gives a certain tone to your life. Prayer, I don't know, I just, my first ministry was prayer. Prayer is a very powerful thing. Prayer makes you see things before they are seen. Prayer makes you see through people motives. Prayer makes you hear what people are not saying. Prayer prepares you. Prayer keeps you sharp. Prayer creates conviction in the right places. So because my first ministry was prayer, somebody who is not on that path can't really hang with you because if you can't pray, you can't hang. You would not have been able to hang around us because it was a lot of time in prayer. And I don't know if people are willing to sacrifice just to pray because they like you. It's not easy to pray for long, you know. My, the security locked me in at my church one night. You know, we were there praying and they called my father and said, hey, you know, we, we're ready to lock up and these guys said they're praying. My father said, lock them in there. It came in the morning for us. We couldn't get out. We saw a scripture that said, seek the Lord until, and we didn't think we, the until had come yet. So we wanted to keep praying. They lock us in there. That's when we got songs for Broadway Boys. We got those songs in the spirit. We were locked in church praying because the scripture said, seek him until it didn't happen. So we were going until. And the fourth layer, so I gave you sincerity in the things of God. I also gave you um, prayer. I also gave you, uh, what's the second one I gave you just now? Prayer. Yeah. Do you want to hear yeah. your, your daughter? Do you want to right. the, the, the conviction. And the last one was wisdom. I could, I could take Proverbs 7 and give you an entire full day conference to young people on the wisdom of what you say, and what you do, and how that will attract the right and repel the wrong. You have to have wisdom with relationships. It's not something that you can be ignorant of. Your words, flirting, my father taught me a simple thing. You drop in the young ladies who make them sit down in the front. Don't let anybody get, a, I mean, in the back. Don't let anybody get accustomed to sitting in your front since you have made a commitment to them. Plus, he said, drop them first, drop the guys last. He said, tell me that. I want to do the opposite. 
can get the guys away and drop the girls last. So I could talk to them. He said, no, do it the other way around. Because if he ever got accused for anything, because he knew how dangerous the times we live. He said, if you ever got accused, it's her word against yours. Don't do that. And then hang out in groups. These are wise counseling. Wise hang out in groups. It's not things you want to do when you're young because you, you want time, you want to, you know, like and what. But when you follow that counsel, it, it really helps. So I share those things with young people. So that, that is what helped me. I really did not have many relationships because probably the mantle looked too strong for people to come around. I don't think, I didn't think it was attractive to girls, you know, it, 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 <laughs> Thinking back, I, I carried a lot. The, the calling was at 16, as in your prime, I think, when you said people, it was too much. They saw to, to the things of God. So there are very few people who would have even wanted to be around. Right? I had two relationships before I got married. One was a broken engagement, uh, and that was my first. And one other, and then so I didn't have a lot of, rela my first relationship was almost when I was 20, 21 or 22 years old, never had any relationships before. Just kept very focused. I played a lot of sports, played national, things of God, ministry, music, band, very focused studies. That's, that was the trajectory of my life. So I don't know if that's a formula, but I'm just from my experience, those were the things that really helped me. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Kwame. This is really good. Um, I think like you said, that what you just described is what you said earlier. We don't put God in a box. God show up, shows up to us just how we need him in our journey so we can get what he wants us to get. Yes. And, and that is that is so rich. Thank you. Thank you. We so appreciate you taking the time to come and be with us today and to share. And I just want to say to you that um, the facilitators, I showed up in an amazing way today through you to do the work needed to be done on this platform for those who are here on this platform. And we want to bless you. We want to want to pray for you before you leave, you know, and thank you so much for your uh, time and to have the opportunity to come the day after your very mother to talk of that life in such a powerful way. That, my friend, you know what I sat here and said? I would like the same of me someday. Amen. Amen. that's how I'm remembered, you know, in this way. So thank you. Thank you for being here and doing that. And uh, Sister Veneta is going to, going to pray for you, my friend, because it is just such a wonderful opportunity to, to sit under your ministry today. Amen. 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 Pastor Luke, I'm one of those who watched you from a distance myself as the Lord did the transformation with your life. Those Broadway boys songs, I knew those had to come out of heaven. No way those songs could have done what they did unless they came from heaven. Father, this day is a very, very significant day on your calendar. And we want to thank you for it. Lord, it is the day when you invited ministers, kids, to come to an offering you were giving. Lord, we thank you for those who heard and accepted this invitation. And we thank you for what you've done in their lives today. Lord, I thank you for Minister Luke. And I thank you that you gave him the, the stories that he shared today, for today, his life, his journey, the pathway was for today, for some other young man, some other young woman to be able, Lord, to make sense out of the quagmire that they're in. Lord, I bless you for this man, this mighty man of God that he has grown up into. Lord, we praise you. You are just 
so awesome. I tell you, there is no describing you. There is no telling of the goodness of God. Father, thank you for the path that Luke has trod. And now that has become, it, it, it is a journey that he has shared that others can take a path, take that same path into your heart and into a strong, vibrant, living relationship with the living God who wants nothing else. That's all the Lord wants, a relationship with his precious children. And Lord, these children, these pastor's kids, Luke has so ably explained that the faith that was in their parents actually resides in them. Ah, Lord, what an amazing thing. I know many are upset by that truth, but it is a truth. He discovered it in his own life. And these ones will discover it in their lives after a while. Father, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I bless this man. I bless his children. I bless the path he's walking and that those children of his will walk on his shoulders. They will step off into a place he's never been, into things he's never done. But they will do so with confidence because the foundation is sure. Lord, we just bless you today. We pronounce the blessing of God Almighty, the kind that makes rich, the kind that adds no sorrow with it, even as he sorrows the loss of his mom. God, the relationship they shared, uh, the faith that lives in him that was first in his mom. Thank you that you are undergirding him. Thank you for the strength you are giving him. Thank you that his children will feed off that strength. Thank you, Lord. The people around him will, will do similarly. Lord, we pray for his dad at this time. Lord, doing life without his wife, that's going to take some doing. But you will walk with him. You will teach him the new steps to take. Thank you, Father. Thank you. You've got this whole thing in the, your control. So today we bless Luke. And uh, from God's Anatomy for Marriage platform, this amazing platform set up by these facilitators we have, we bless him. Oh God, we don't know where this is gonna go. We don't know what, what doors this will open, but we bless him to go with you as he's going. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed, amen. Amen and amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Vanessa, for your prayer. Before I ask uh, Reverend Karim to come back to talk about our next help session next month in August, I just want to say thanks to Pastor Luke. Pastor Luke, uh, God is amazing. You know, um, the facilitators on this platform, you know, uh, we, the, the offering, we always ensure that they have preeminence, that they take full control. And let me tell you, they took over today. And what I want to tell you is that the minister's children, God prepared a special offering for them today. And what they received was the first fruit overflow of your mother's anointing through your life. That legacy that has been passed on, they got that baton fresh through you. And I want to thank God and I declare that the faith that has been passed on through you will impact generations of all those who are on this platform going forward. Sister Debbie's faith continues to live. And I want to thank you so much. I want to thank Darren so much for sharing as well. God bless you both. And may the words that you have shared and your faith continue to live on as we continue to do what God has called us to do through this platform, God's Anatomy for Marriage. Thank you so much for being here. Reverend Karim, back to you. Thank you. 
<clears throat> thank you, Reverend Lawrence. And again, um, thank you, uh, Pastor Luke. Thank you, Darren, for your, your sharing and your experience. It's been very encouraging. And we want to continue this help series. So we have help a minister's wife. Today we talk about help a minister's kids. And next month, August 20th, same time on the same platform, we are going to be talking about help. We are family ministry. So we're going to talk about the whole family now. So we want to invite you to talk to pastors and their family, you know, and just bring them on because uh, both Luke and Darren have said some things that, that I think needs to be uh, fleshed out and articulated to, to families. And here's the, here is how it's going to go uh, for the next session. We are not concerned about the things that are happening outside of the family as much as we want to fortify and strengthen the family so that they can deal with anything that's happening outside of the family. So please uh, come join us again uh, next month, uh, 20th, at the same time. Help, we are family ministry. And I believe, I, I once again, the facilitators uh, would show up and uh, like, like they did today, like they did with the minister's wife, and just bring renewing and hope and we're focusing and restraining. I keep saying ministry was, God's call to ministry was never meant to be destructive to the family. It was meant for the family to be a representation of God and what he does. And unfortunately, too many happen to ministers. And you've heard uh, both Darren and, and Pastor talking about it. That has made ministry such a discouraging thing. But I will remind you today, what God has called us to is never discouraging. It's just that sometimes we lose perspective on how it ought to be done. So come join us next, next month, 20th. Help we are family ministry and please invite as much pastors and their families as you can. I think it will be also a very rewarding and rich, informative time. So thank you all once again for being on the platform and, and being part of this with us today. And I mean, God bless you as you continue to to uh, journey with him as pastors, kids, as, as pastors in this platform, as the team members here. Uh, thank you for taking the time to join us on uh, today's session of help. I'm a minister. So Reverend Lawrence, um, I am through. I'm not saying any final words, but I want to say thank to all. Amen. God bless you.